Hi everyone and welcome to the latest instalment on the History of Medicine videos. Video number 11. Now then, before we start, oh, ah, I cut myself earlier today and I had to put a bandage on. Now, have a think. Why, if I've cut myself, did I wash it and then put a bandage on? Any ideas? Well, here's a clue. Way, cheers. Ah, a lovely drink of milk. What has milk got to do with medicine, I hear you ask? Well, that of course was pasteurized milk. Any ideas now? That's right, welcome. This video is about a man, a French chemist called Louis Pasteur born in 1822, died in 1895. And he was the top chemist in France. Very, very skilled and determined man. Now, what did he do? You have to remember the Industrial Revolution, the 1800s. People did know about germs. The microscope had been invented and people were aware of germs. But unfortunately, they had completely the wrong idea. Many, many doctors believed in the theory of spontaneous generation. Somehow the germs were created either by the bad smells or the rotting flesh or the decaying matter. This was wrong, but they didn't know that. So if, for example, you cut yourself before Louis Pasteur, Doctors would see that, yes, the cut could turn infected. It could go bad. It could decay. To the doctors of the time, they would say, aha, the germs have been created inside the cut. This was wrong. And Louis Pasteur, one of the things he did, one of the many things he did, was he proved that this was wrong. He showed spontaneous generation as an idea, as a theory, was incorrect. How did he do it? Well, time for another of my drinks. Not milk this time. Cheers! A lovely glass of red wine. Ah, actually, it's cranberry juice, but it looks like red wine and I don't drink wine. So, cheers! 1857. In France, the wine industry was struggling. In the process of making wine, something was happening, which meant that the wine, instead of being beautiful, the wine tasted bad. And if wine is tasting bad and horrible, people will not buy it. So therefore they were losing money. So the manufacturers, called Pasteur and said, look, come and investigate. Why is our wine tasting bad? Using his technology, the microscopes, using his knowledge, he looks at the process and he sees that in the vats where they've got the wine, he sees there are germs. Ping! He has an idea. Pasteur's idea was this. He said, maybe the germs are making the wine go bad. Therefore, try boiling the liquid and killing the germs. Now, we call that process today pasteurization, pasteurized milk, boiling it, cooling it, sealing it, free from germs. So the wine industry played a role here in helping medicine. Once Pasteur has made this discovery, he then says, right, I wonder if this can be used elsewhere. And he does what for us now is a very, very simple experiment. But at the time, it was very important. Get two, two beakers. I'll use two glasses here. Get some water. Boil the water. By boiling the water, of course, you kill the germs. One, this is a simplified version of the experiment. One, cover 
so that nothing from the air can get in. The other, leave it open to the air. There's the experiment. After a few days, take some liquid from both. Look at them under the microscope. What did Pasteur discover? The liquid from this, which had been open to the air, was full of germs. The liquid from this, which had been closed, separated from the air, covered, had no germs. What was the only conclusion? The germs had come from the air. In other words, spontaneous generation was not correct. Pasteur proved 1861, germs are in the air, germs cause decay. And then that would lead to the next step that germs cause disease. 1861, germ theory. This was to revolutionize medicine. But it didn't happen straight away. Progress did not happen immediately once Pasteur had done his experiment. Things stayed the same for a while. Slowly, yes, they did change. And we're going to have a look at that now. Potentially, therefore, germ theory 1861 was hugely significant, but progress was slow. It would be a while before they would get better treatments, better cures, better preventions. But it will come. And Pasteur was right at the start of it. 1861, germ theory. Now, of course, Pasteur being a great scientist, he wrote down the results of his experiments. He did the experiments. Many doctors still preferred the old idea of spontaneous generation. But Pasteur slowly begins to change their minds through science, through experiments, through proof. But he does not do it alone. He is helped, or rather someone else joins the story. It's a man called Robert Koch, a German scientist, a German doctor, 1843 to 1910. So living at the same time as Pasteur. Now, Pasteur was French. Koch was German. That's important for the story. Because 1870, 1871, there was the Franco-Prussian War, basically a war between France and what is now mainly Germany. Pasteur's son actually fought in the war. So here we have a war between France and Germany. Pasteur and Koch. Now the Germans won the war. The Prussians won the Franco-Prussian War. How did this help medicine? Normally war is a terrible thing. War does not normally help make progress. But it did in this case. Any ideas how? Well, Here's an old song you may have heard as a child. Anything you can do, I can do better. I can do anything better than you. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. What's that all about? Pasteur and Koch. Because they were on different sides in the war, they developed a very intense rivalry or competition. And anything that Pasteur did, Koch would try to outdo him. And if Koch came up with a bit of a development, Pasteur would try to improve on that. And so on, and so on, and so on. So we get the two of them in the story. Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch. And war played a part in that. Now, Koch, of course, read Pasteur's work. Germs are in the air. Germs cause decay. Germs cause disease. But he improves on it. What did he do? Well, put simply, Koch begins the process of showing which specific germ caused which specific disease. How he did that, we'll look at in a minute. Why would that be important, do you think? Yes. If you are going to come up with a cure, you need to know which germ to attack. You can't just say, oh, it's germs you need to know which particular microbe or bacteria to attack. And this was Koch's development, his improvement on Pasteur. 
So you get the two of them throughout the 1870s and into the 1880s. So, for example, Robert Koch, 1876, he does work on anthrax. 1882, he does work on tuberculosis. 1883, he does work on cholera. Three very big and important diseases. And Robert Koch is doing work to try to prevent these diseases. Vaccinations. At the same time, we got Louis Pasteur saying, oh, we don't want Koch to get all the credit. Quick, we need to work on it. 1879, he does chicken cholera work. 1881, anthrax in sheep. 1885, he does work on rabies. So the two men are involved. Okay, that's an important part of the story. Now, think back. Video number 10, we did work on Edward Jenner and vaccinations and smallpox. Remember that? And I said Jenner's work was good, but it only worked in smallpox and he didn't know why it worked. He couldn't explain it. Well, here we have Louis Pasteur. He does some work in his laboratory with his research team. He's not doing it on his own. And he begins to work out. If you get a weak germ and somehow inject it into the body, that's what then protects you against a stronger disease. He called this attenuation, the weaker germ protecting against the stronger disease. Then, of course, he's able to say, aha, yes, that's why Jenner's work on smallpox worked. Somehow the cowpox weaker are protected against the stronger smallpox. So Pasteur's work on attenuation explained vaccinations. And that's why Koch and Pasteur were able to develop vaccines for all of those diseases that I've just mentioned. Koch, anthrax, TB, cholera, Pasteur, chicken cholera, anthrax, rabies. So Oh, Louis Pasteur is working with sheep, yes, for the anthrax, and he's working with rabies and the dogs, sheep and dogs. Don't tell me that Pasteur was barking mad. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I just had to put in a terrible joke there. I apologise. He was working, of course, with chicken cholera. Now, at first, it didn't work. And they're saying to him, oh, we don't know what to do. And Pasteur said, that's a poultry excuse. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Back to the sheep. At first, it wasn't working. And Pasteur said, someone's trying to pull the wool over my eyes. <laughs> right, that's it. No more jokes. No more jokes. Sorry. Let's get back to the serious stuff. So Pasteur helps to explain the work of Jenna. Important. But let's not underestimate the work of Robert Koch. I've said that he does work on the specific germ producing the specific dis disease. OK, now what else did he do? Robert Koch develops agar jelly, a solid culture, which was easier to grow the bacteria or the germ. Pasteur could only grow it in the liquid. It's not as easy. Koch improved on Pasteur. Koch also developed industrial dyes so that he could stain the bacteria so he could see the specific or particular germ underneath the microscope. This was technology. This was better. It meant it was easier to identify certain germs, the industrial dyes. He also, Robert Koch, develops and uses the new technology of photographs and cameras so we can take photos of these germs and send them to other scientists for them to work on. So Robert Koch also is very, very important in the story. What factors have we looked at so far? War, rivalry, competition, science, technology, equipment, money. The German government provided Koch with money so he could have a properly funded laboratory to do his work. The French then would do the same for Pasteur. Government, finance, 
Both of them had great research teams. Robert Koch worked with a man called Paul Ehrlich, and I'll do a video on him later. Louis Pasteur worked with a man called Charles Chamberland and Emile Roux. So they are not on their own. They're working with a team of the scientists who could check their work or be expert in one thing that they're not expert in, research teams. So we come to the final part of the video. How significant, how important was germ theory? Was it more important than Jenner? What do you think? Right, here's a couple of things. At eventually, of course, it was a huge step forward, but not immediately, not in 1861. People still believed in spontaneous generation. People still blamed bad air, bad smells, because they could smell it, or they could see the infection in the body. They couldn't see these small, tiny, microscopic microbes or germs, so they went with what they could see and smell. It took time for Pasteur and Koch to change their minds. But eventually, yes, it led to far better preventions, vaccinations for all of those diseases I mentioned. Eventually, it began to lead to cures to actually make people better once they got the disease. I'll do a video on them later. Finally, Pasteur's germ theory helped in other areas of medicine. It helped in surgery. A man called Joseph Lister, as we'll see later in a forthcoming video, Pasteur's work helped improve surgery. Also, finally, Pasteur's work also helped improve public health. The Industrial Revolution, the major towns and the cities were filthy. After Pasteur and germ theory, people begin to clean them up. Why? We'll talk about later. So, our old pupil, Izzy. Is he important? Well then, let's ask Izzy. How important was germ theory and the work of Louis Pasteur? Where would you put it? How important was Robert Koch and his work? developing this new science of what he called bacteriology. Where do you put it? Is Pasteur more significant than Jenner? Is Koch more significant than Pasteur? Or are they all important? Have a think. Hope it's been useful. Sorry for the terrible jokes. I'm just going to finish with a lovely glass of cranberry juice. Cheers. All the best. Perfect. See you soon.